On this episode, we talk with finance mastermind Andrew Stotts about the ups and downs and do's and don'ts of investing in Thailand. So if you're anyone from a professional investor to someone with just a few extra bucks to invest, you should learn a lot on this episode of the Bangkok Podcast. Sawadee crap and welcome to the Bangkok Podcast. My name is Greg Jorgensen, a Canadian who followed a friend to Thailand in 2001, and when he went back home, I just kind of didn't. And I'm Ed Knuth, an American who came to Thailand on a one-year teaching contract 17 years ago. Now, we want to say a quick thank you to those who support the show on Patreon and via other means. If you want to join this cool little club, you get swag, you get each episode a day early, and you even get an uncensored weekly bonus episode. We just recorded this week's bonus show, and we talked about my trip to Laos and what it's like being sick in Bangkok. Why, you ask? Well, because Ed just got over a cold, I'm still getting over mine, and Evo is down for the count with one, which is why Ed is graciously filling in for Evo this week. So... To get all that good stuff, just head to bangkokpodcast.com slash support and check it out. Before we jump into it, we have to mention an item from the corrections department. Yes, we, yes, we do very rarely make a mistake. But uh, last <laughs> week, Evo and Greg tried to guess the width of the Chow Praia River. Uh, if you want to get in a last minute guess, you can guess right now how wide it is. Uh, Evo <laughs> said it was 150 meters wide. Greg said it was only 120. Um, Well, I've actually measured it, and it's 208 meters wide at Toxin Bridge. So the more you know. Interesting. Well, I guess I could make a joke here about uh, underestimating the size of things. I I don't know where I'm going to go with that. But But I don't don't often have to uh, measure the width of rivers, but I guess I should get my my estimation. uh, Yeah, work on that. Yeah, it's not very good. So on this episode, we are happy to have a name that anyone into finance would know, a one Mr. Andrew Stotts, PhD. Andrew is an award-winning equity analyst, the current president of the CFA Society Thailand, and the founder and CEO of A. Stotts Investment Research. Prior to that, he spent 20 years working in global investment banks in Asia and has been a university lecturer in finance for more than two decades, so the dude knows his stuff. He's also the co-founder of Coffee Works Co. Limited, Thailand's specialty coffee roaster, so the guy knows his way around a cup of joe too, and anyone who knows that ain't all bad in my book. So we're glad he could come on the show, and I got him online to talk about the do's and don'ts of investing in Thailand, so here we go. So let's let's kick this off right away. Now, personally, and no offense, the only thing I'm less interested in in finance is sports. And when you hear that, it must be like me hearing someone say they're not interested in seeing Star Wars. Like, I'll go to great lengths to try and tell them what's awesome about it and give them a soft intro. So how would you do something like that with finance and investing? Where would someone like me begin? Well, I think the, the first thing is, you know, uh, you may you may not like cooking, but you still have to eat. <laughs> right. Okay. That's, right? that's very true. And the point is, is that we're all working, you know, most people are working pretty darn hard to try to make a living and get by. And if they don't think about their money and the finance aspect of it, then, you know, in the end, it can be an awfully painful, you know, situation. So though I know that many people don't want to think about it, the reality is, is that uh, we really need to think about it. Right, right. And I, I'll tell you, I've, I've got very few real regrets in life, but one of them, seriously, is not listening to people when I was younger saying, put $5 a month away, but put $5 a week, whatever you can afford, just keep doing it. Man, I'd be I'd be set if I did that. But you know, yeah. when, you're, when you're a kid, you're like, ah, old people, they don't know anything. But um, I wrote a book for that. Oh, yeah? And it's called How to Start Building Your Wealth, Investing in the Stock Market. I wrote it for my my five nieces back in America. And, you know, when they were 18, I gave them each about 3,000 US and then helped them to get started. And as I told them, if you follow what I tell you to do, (laughs) you will be a millionaire by the time you're 40. All right, Bangkok Podcast listeners, if one of you invents a time machine, buy Andrew's book and go back and give it to me when I was about 16. (laughs) 
<laughs> <laughs> the harder thing is getting us to listen when we were 16, as exactly. you say. You might have to smack it around a little bit. And now I've I've tried over the years to 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 get interested and to to learn about it, but a lot of the information online is directed at American or North American or European based investors, and it doesn't apply to a lot of uh, investing in Thailand. And if it does, it's in Thai, which basically makes it unreadable. So, can you give me a quick rundown uh, of the options foreign investors have in Thailand? So I, I don't know a, a blue chip from a Dorito. So what what types of things are open to non Thais here? Well, the the first thing that's open to non-ties is opening up a brokerage account and usually either through a bank or a bank's, you know, s- subsidiary that they have a broker. So that's the first thing that uh, an investor could do. The second thing an investor could do is could go to a mutual fund company and open up an account and put money into a mutual fund. So if they were going to open up a brokerage account, it usually means that they would be buying and selling stocks on their own or on the advice of someone. And if they open up a mutual fund account, it would mean that they would be buying some sort of fund where a fund manager is doing the buying and selling of the stocks. Now, literally, I, I, I that, that sounds good, but I literally don't know how to do that. Do I need my passport? Do I need a work permit? Do I need a credit card? Can I just walk into any bank? Like what, what needs to happen? I'm not up on all of the requirements these days, but generally, um, the, one of the most important things is you need money. <laughs> so you got to go in there with a, a bank account or something that you can say, okay, I can transfer money into this account. You're not going to walk in, obviously, with cash. So you would want to open up an account. Now, in the case of the bank these days, I know that they require a valid visa, I don't think that they, for, for most of the things, they don't require a work permit, but um, some things they may. But generally, if you have a valid visa, you should be able to open up an account. Okay. Okay. That's fair enough. Because I think we've all been there when we walk into a Thai bank and we ask for the simplest of operation and it just takes hours and 15 people to figure out. So something like this uh, is, quite frankly, it would be intimidating for me. I would just sort of like, ah, forget it. Yeah, I think that when you get into the zone about doing something like this, um, the best way to think about it is when you're going to the bank or to the broker is to just say, cool down and I'm going to take the time that I need to get this done right. And <laughs> it's going to take some time. And of course, when when we're not fluent in the language, let's say, of where we are or something like that, well, things get more complicated. I think I've talked about that before on the podcast is whenever I go into a bank, I have to sort of stand outside going like, okay, you can do this. Don't worry <laughs> about it. It's going to be on, you know, I have to give yourself like a little pep talk. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're, they're, they're trying their best. I mean, that's for sure. So it's, uh, I, I, I tend to, um, you know, I, I can speak Thai so I can go in there and speak, but I tend to, um, go to my assistant, let's say for my, uh, my secretary, and I basically try to find either her or someone else to help me kind of stage things a bit. So that's one little trick is if you can find a friend or an assistant to help you, you know, get things staged, then it can make it a little bit easier when you go in. The funny thing about Thai banks is that they either operate in the 17th century or the 23rd century. You know, when it works out well, it's like, wow, that was incredibly easy. But other times you're banging your head against the wall. Yep. I've been through both. <laughs> so speaking about... Um, once once you open up a brokerage account of some type, um, is investing only open to those who have, say, like 50,000 bot to invest every month or those with a fat expat salary? Like what, what about uh, what about teachers or, or freelancers or office drones like myself who have very limited disposable income? Say I've got hmm. say I've got 5,000 or 10,000 bot a month or every few months. What, what would you do with that? Well, I think that um, the, the reality is that no matter how – little or um, large amount you're making, uh, you've got to, you know, start to set up a discipline of saving and investing. So you never want to let a limited amount of salary during a period of time to stop you from that. Now, the reality is, though, in Thailand, just like a lot of emerging markets, uh, financial services are really expensive and are, you know, can be painful. I mean, when we look at a lot of the, for instance, literature that comes out of the U.S. about um, investing, a lot of it's just based completely on the U.S. And the U.S. is an extremely efficient 
market where the cost of products are, you know, m massively lower than in most other countries and certainly in emerging markets. So that's mm -hmm. the first thing is that things tend to be, you know, a little bit more expensive um, here. So therefore, the if you were to tell me that you say I have $5,000 each month, the first thing you want to do is 5,000 baht. Yeah, sorry, 5,000 baht. Sorry. I wish I had $5,000 every month. I'm an optimist. <laughs> So the first thing that I would say is you have 5,000 baht a month is that you should probably go and set up a savings account, a separate savings account from the one that you're normally using or that your salary gets deposited in and use that as a place where you accumulate that 5,000 baht and you put it into that savings account every single month until you build up enough. Let's say that could be 20, 40, 50,000 kind of depends on where you're trading and what's going on. But, you know, you'd need to get probably something like 40, 50, 60,000 baht to really make it worth your while to go and then execute something. And the okay. the cost of actually starting something, it tends to be a little bit higher. Like, you know, the initial amount you've got to put in, maybe 30,000 baht or 20,000 baht or something like that. And then after you've got things started, then you can do regular uh, contributions uh, at maybe 5,000 baht or something like that. That, that's a very interesting insight because recently I got a Citibank credit card and they gave me a limit that I shouldn't have. But I went into the bank and I said, hey, okay, this is great, but I want a Citibank bank account, just a savings account that I can put money in and out of and move it around a little bit. Not a lot. And they're like, yeah, sure. Um, there's two options. You could start one with a million bot or five million bot <laughs> or whatever it was. And I was like, okay, it's so far above what's possible. It's not even worth continuing the conversation. So it's it's it seems to be that like, obviously you're correct. Um it's just very expensive here getting set up. Yeah. I mean, in that case, what you're describing is, you know, let's say that the average person is going to want to start with a small amount of money. And that would not be a good idea to approach a foreign bank because a foreign bank has a lot of overhead and expenses. They're going to try to target a, you know, mid to high level uh, income person. But a Thai bank or a Thai broker or a Thai fund management company is targeting people who are at that level. And so I would say you probably just need to change the, you know, the organization or the company of the bank that you're going to, and you would find much more um, reasonable terms probably. Okay. That's good to know. That's good to know. What, what are some of the things that foreigners are not allowed to do in Thailand that someone might walk into a bank and ask and then be surprised that they're like, Oh, I got stonewalled here. Well, Generally, it's not so bad. I mean, as most of the things related to investing in the markets you can do. Um, the hard There are some hard things to do, such as um, moving money out of Thailand. Uh, my first advice to people that say, what would be, you know, what would be the number one thing you'd say? I'd say, never bring your money into Thailand. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, that rolls nicely into my next question, which is, um, what are your long-term thoughts about investment in Thailand? I've heard lots of bar stool experts and squawkers on thaivisa.com say they'd never invest here. It's too unstable. It's too volatile, et cetera. Well, what do you think? Well, I'm going to put on my, my PhD hat and teach you about something called home country bias. And awesome. All right. Home country bias is basically uh, very simple. When you ask anybody in the world, where do you invest? They say, well, I invest in my country. So you're, you're Thai, you invest in Thailand, you're living in Thailand, you invest in Thailand, you are German, you invest in Germany, and this is called home country bias. Majority of people only invest in the country that they live in. Now, the reality is, is that there are, let's say, 30 reasonable size stock markets in the world in 30 different countries. What is the probability that this one country's stock market is the one that's going to go up the most over the next five or 10 years? Okay. Well, it's one in 30. And the reality is, is that you could be in a situation where the market's going to be flat or go down for five years. So therefore, if you had no constraints, you would probably own like what I talk about in my book about how to start building your wealth, investing in the stock market. I say, well, your first choice, if you had, if you had the ability to do it is to own every stock in the world. Sure. Yeah. That'd be nice. And there, there are instruments out there by companies like Vanguard, as an example, where you can set up an account for, let's say, $3,000 to set up a fund account where you're buying a fund that owns every stock in the world. 
So that's your first choice. But the problem that we have with that choice is that Vanguard doesn't operate in Thailand. So it's pretty much impossible for a Thai to open up such an account or, or Westerner living in Thailand. Now, what does happen is that Vanguard also has ETFs, exchange traded funds. And these are just simply a fund that owns every stock in the world that happens to be traded like a stock on the stock market. You can buy and sell it. Okay. The benefit of that is that there are some brokers in Thailand that you could walk into them and say, I want to buy this Vanguard ETF. And believe it or not, they would, they would facilitate that process through their brokerage business. Now, the fees to that are not going to be cheap compared to developed markets. Maybe you would pay 50, uh, let's say a half a percentage point for that transaction, which is in Thailand, when you're trading in the domestic market, you may be paying, you know, 0.2, let's say. Okay. So, but that's the, the first thing to think about is that if you can invest across the world, you should probably try to do that. Fair enough. That does make sense to me. Look at that. I learned something already. You're a pretty good teacher. (laughs) So uh, more specifically about Thailand's uh, unique situation here, next time there's a coup, because we got to think someone's going to happen again eventually, what are you you going to do finance-wise? What's your first first order of business? Well, I think that um, Thailand, you know, besides the fact that we had a massive crisis that happened in 97, Mm -hmm. and and that brought down the market and all that, the, the actual condition of... Thai companies and Thai banks are is very strong. Thai consumers, I would say, very strong. They've um, so the con- the financial condition of the country and also of the government pretty strong. So therefore, I don't see Thailand as like a high risk sort of country. The second thing is that when there's a coup or some other extreme event like that, yes, the market may fall, but the best thing to do is probably to buy at that time. Oh yeah. And once it's gone down, because what we can see about Thailand is, you know, there's all political parties, including ones that are supported by military versus others. They all want business to go well. Right. Sure. So, so therefore it's unlikely that they're going to do something, you know, you know, really damaging to the overall economy. So the biggest risk that you have in Thailand is just that the market gets so expensive that, you know, you end up buying at a high price and it takes years for it to get back. And the one risk we face right now across the world is that the stock markets across the world, none of them are cheap. They're all getting expensive. And therefore, the probability of, let's say, a one or two year positive return is getting lower the higher you buy it. Okay, so it's more trending towards long term stuff. Yeah. So if somebody said, wow, I listened to Greg and Andrew talk about stocks and I'm really interested and I've got, you know, X amount, I got a million baht and and I'm going to go put it in. Well, you probably want to think carefully about that right now. In (laughs) fact, having a 5,000 baht a month contribution is probably actually not a bad thing (laughs) because you would be putting in, you know, an equal amount every single month. And then, yeah, the market may be high, but eventually it'll come down and then you're buying the stocks cheap. And when it's high, you're buying them expensive. Right, right. My wife lost a lot of money doing that. <laughs> I uh, I own a very, a very small amount of investments and um, I've just kind of forgotten they exist, which is, I think, the best thing for me to do because I don't know enough about them to start playing fast and loose with trading. <laughs> right. All right. Well, before we get out of here, last question, you're probably going to roll your eyes at this, but what are your thoughts on cryptocurrency? Well, I have to say that it's outside of my area of competency. Now, if you listen to a man who's worked his whole life in the field of finance up to the level of a PhD in finance say that, then that may be a message (laughs) right there. (laughs) However, if I was to say one thing about cryptocurrency that I find fascinating is that it provides an opportunity for individuals to get around governments. Right. And I'm kind of all for that. However, this is the positive, but this is also the negative. I'm un- under the opinion myself that there will come a time that governments around the world clamp down on cryptocurrencies. And when they do, it's going to change the landscape of how things happen. So it's not going to become a, uh, a, a, a way of transacting around the government anymore. So the strength of it will in- be an inherent weakness. 
And so that's kind of the biggest thing. But as far as trading it up and down, I must admit that uh, I don't think that I can provide much guidance on that. You're a very wise man, Andrew Stotts. What did I say? Uh, better to keep your mouth closed and let people think you're an idiot than to open it and remove all doubt. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've just accomplished that. Thank you. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on the show, man. That was that was really interesting. And uh, you've sort of you sort of flattened it out a bit in terms of being intimidated by trying to do it. So are, are there any websites or, or, or information portals kind of thing where someone can go and learn about investing in Thailand and where the resources are in English? Or another language? That's a good. That's a good question. I mean, my website is called Become a Better Investor dot net. It's not necessarily geared towards investing in Thailand, although I'll sometimes talk about it. There's a a, a business called Phenomenon, and mm-hmm. that um, I'll have to get the actual spelling. It's like F I N. Phenomenon. Yeah, and um, I think that's that's probably one that's 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 growing and looking interesting for providing people a platform to buy and sell, um, you know, at reasonable rates and understand kind of the products that are out there. So that's, that's one, but I'm not sure about the, about others for right now. All right. Well, we'll put a link to that on our site as well as your site. And, um, yeah, everyone out there buy Andrew's book. If you want to, uh, if you want to start, start socking some money away. And like they say, the, uh, the, the best time to, to plant a tree is 10 years ago. The second best time is today. Right. So. Amen. Get off your ass and do it. And I'm speaking to myself too. Andrew, thanks so much for coming on. All right. Thank you, Greg. Next station, Nana. So some great tips from Andrew there. And like we were talking about, I should have ordered his books a long time ago, but I guess, well, I guess now was better than ever. I agree. And now it's time for everyone's favorite segment of the show, Love, Loathe, or Leave, where we look at one minor aspect of living in Bangkok and find out if it's something the two of us love about living in Bangkok, loathe about the expat life, or if it's something we hate so much that it just might cause us to leave Thailand. And this week, Greg, it is your turn. Yeah, technically it's my turn, but actually I got a suggestion from uh, from our buddy Ed, the listener Ed. He uh, sent in a good love, loather, leave suggestion. And Ed, I'm going to call you primary Ed, and the other guy I'm going to call other Ed. So other Ed sent in this suggestion for primary Ed and me, Greg, <laughs> to discuss, if that makes any sense. All right, let's hear it. So Ed, what do you think when um, something goes wrong in Thailand? It happens a lot. It happens from time to time. Something doesn't go as expected. And you complain to someone and you come up to them and you say, look, I was expecting this and I got this. This isn't going to work. And they say, oh, my pen lie. My pen lie. Ah, yes. The classic I... Thai, my pen lie. Which, listener, if, if you're not familiar with this, it means, oh, don't worry about it. Or, oh, never mind. It's just sort of, oh, forget about it. Yeah, that is a common Thai response. And, uh, of course, uh, it's not going to be love. Uh, I don't love it. Uh, in, the, in, in that circumstance, I don't love it. Uh, and I think it's, uh, I think the, for me, the, the annoying aspect to it is when they say my pen right, it's really their attitude towards it. But they, they assume that you have the same reaction that they have. And so they're really kind of not respecting the fact that something is upsetting you. I don't really mind if it doesn't upset them. But if it upsets me, I feel like they should respect that. Right, right. And sometimes when someone says like, oh, yeah, my pen rai, you want to say, no, Ben, Ben, this is a problem. This is an issue and we need to figure it out. We can't just sort of brush it under the mat, you know? Yes, I, I would agree. Um, although, you know, it's for me, it's not uh, it's not a leave thing. So I'm going to go with uh, I'm going to go with loathe. Uh, I think it is, you know, this is uh, the my pen rai thing is uh, uh, probably on the list of the top five things that make Thailand both charming and frustrating. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it, that, that attitude is part of like Thai casualness, which is very refreshing in many circumstances where the, the fact that Thai people do not take a lot of stuff very seriously, that's refreshing. It's like, it's like, you know, like in my experience, the chance of getting into a confrontation in Thailand is much less than it would be in the U.S. Like, I feel like in the States, I'm much more likely to get into a pointless confrontation than I am in Thailand. But the flip side of it is that when there's something that needs to be addressed seriously and they don't want to talk about it, it can be frustrating. 
Yeah, very well put. Very well put. Although I would like to flip it around one time. Like next time I go into a bank and they say, oh, you need your passport. I just want to go, oh, my pen lie. Don't worry about <laughs> it. You know, or a cop pulls me over for speeding. My pen lie. You know. <laughs> well, well <laughs> see you how far I get. It. You know, this reminds me of uh, one of my buddy's favorite expressions about Thailand. He likes to say, in Thailand, there are no rules until there are rules. And, you know, it, it captures this idea that they let so much stuff slide. But then when they have a certain rule, like you have to have your bank book in the bank, uh, then Ugh. they then they just don't bend. But maybe that's right. a topic. Maybe that's a topic for another show. We could build a whole show around that, although it's probably pretty easy for us to come off as two just bitching barstool professionals or <laughs> just complaining about everything. Which we're it's, clearly not. We're definitely not that. No, clearly not. We're very we're we're professional bitchers, not barstool bitchers. Well, we're you know we're bitchers, uh, but we give reasons. <laughs> right, we give citations. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to go loathe on this one too. Although I'm gonna loathe it with a side order of charm because sometimes it can be refreshing, like you said. No doubt about but, it. Uh, no yeah. doubt but about sometimes, it. But sometimes, damn it, I want a pen. I want a pen. It's <laughs> I agree. want people to take me seriously. Agree. Agreed. All right. Thanks once again to everyone who supports us on Patreon. If you want to get the show early and have access to special patron-only bonus content, head to patreon.com forward slash Bangkok podcast and lend us your support. We would really appreciate it. And thank you to you for listening to the Bangkok podcast. If you have something on your mind or you just want to drop us a line to say hello, how are you doing, what have you, please leave a comment on bangkokpodcast.com or you can reach out directly to me on Twitter where I am BKK Greg. Or you can send us a message either on Facebook or on Twitter or on Line at Bangkok Podcast. We're very good at responding to comments, questions, and heaps of praise just about anywhere. We'll be back next week with more stories of our lives lived in the city of angels right here on the Bangkok Podcast. Oh, man. I think I have to take another sick day tomorrow. <clears throat>